Greetings, YouTube. Mike over on the Weapon Collectors uh, YouTube channel uh, did a video, I think it was yesterday, the day before, where he was talking about his three favorite future post-apocalyptic films. And he made the distinction of saying future post-apocalyptic films. And I don't know many past post-apocalyptic post films, so I was a little confused by that distinction. However, it has inspired me to talk about some of my favorite post-apocalyptic films. Now, the first ones I'm going to talk about are actually a trilogy, and that would be the Mad Max Road Warrior um, trilogy. Yes, I'm cheating. I'm going to include them all three together. Now, the first, Mad Max, only barely qualifies as post-apocalyptic. Um, it really is on the cusp of a resource wars sort of scenario. Um, there's an illusion, illusions that there may have been some very limited nuclear use um, but your details are very sketchy, and mostly we are seeing a real-world breakdown of society, and it's terrifying in a lot of ways. And the film is in very much the genre of the classic revenge film. Um, there really isn't a great deal of post-apocalyptic elements in it, um, but however, it is um, one of the greatest films in that genre, especially if you like revenge and action films that were made. And the great thing about it is that it laid the foundation for one of the most classic post-apocalyptic films, Road Warrior. The one thing I've never really understood about Mad Max, when it was originally released, it was released in the United States with a dubbed voice for Mel Gibson. I have no idea why studio owners thought that Americans would not be able to um, grok Mel Gibson's actual accent. It was just a stupid idea, and the voice they picked, I felt, was wrong for that actor completely. Um, it just didn't sound right. Um, I much prefer his real voice in the film, and if you can get a copy of with his voice and then without the dubbing, definitely watch that instead. Um, the commentary track on that film is also excellent and talks about um, the uh, biker gang that they literally formed for the purposes of that film. It was uh, quite interesting. Then we have a Road Warrior, which is one of the classic films in this genre. It has all of the tropes. It has the the resource war angle. It's got the you know society has broken down completely into into utter tribalism. It has the uh, repurposing the technology of our era into something new and, and into a new world of feudalism of fortresses and warriors with their chariots, their steeds, still barely functioning on the last few f bits of fumes of the oil oil world. Um, the action is awesome. The editing is excellent. The characterizations are wonderful. Mel Gibson puts in, I think, one of the best roles he ever did. He is that character in every way, shape, and form. He plays, he plays Max all the way down to his bones, and I love that film. And then you have the last, which is, you know, what Thunderdome. And in many ways, I see the third film in that series as a cartoon. It, it can't be compared to the first two films, which were so wonderfully real. And the third film was just out of left field. It had some nice elements. It had a lot of tropes that have hooked, been hooked um, and picked up by... Uh, Guy culture, there's a lot of memes in that have translated into the 21st century. And you know, it's cool. We you know I'm glad we have them. Um, Tina Turner looked awesome. I thought she was a weird choice for the film, but you know, she gave it her all, and I really appreciate that, you know, she brought her A game, even if the film that she was she brought it to wasn't an A film. Um, the next in the in the in some of my favorite post-apocalyptic films would be uh, Escape from New York just a wonderful, absurd concept that we would abandon New York City to the criminals, that we would wall it off and just use it as a, a dumping ground, turning it into Americans' Australia. Um, it's a wonderfully strange idea, and it has that feeling of the possible, because we have isolated the poor and the downtrodden and the criminal before, isn't really a shocker that we would try to do so again. Um, so, 
again, the action is great, the storyline is fun, the acting is wonderful, it has so many great tropes in that film. It, it was just a hoot. I can remember seeing it when it first re was released and, and enjoying the heck out of that film. I would also like to make an honorable mention of the film No Escape with Ray Liotta, which is also a prison post-apocalyptic film in the sense that it's also about isolating people on an island who are the baddest of the bad, who are they are so bad they've been rejected from a prison and tossed on an island to die. Um, and, it, and it has that whole rebuilding from from what they can find and build on their own and trying to create a new society. And what was I one of the things I loved about it is they didn't throw in any of these any any throwaway female characters. It was an all male space because it was a male prison that was the inspiration for the for this isolated colony. Um, and I think that that was uh, uh, a bold choice to go to go with. Um, and I think it's also just a fun action film. Yes, it's just as silly as Escape from New York, but it's thoroughly enjoyable. If you haven't seen it and you're a fan of Escape for your of Escape from New York, I think you'd enjoy um, No Escape. Um, and lastly, we have my favorite. Um, post-apocalyptic film which I actually uh, don't own on DVD at this moment which is Damnation Alley and this is based on a short I can't really call it a short story more of a novella I think it's too small to really, too short to really call it a novel um, and the novel concentrates on one man's mission to get drugs from one of the one of the last remaining outposts of civilization in California to New York and he has to drive across the blasted wasteland that is America in the post-apocalyptic world and he drives this um, this vehicle that was very reminiscent of some of the stuff you might have seen from the original Death Race 2000 and he drives across America and has the adventures along the way and it had a much different feel than the movie Damnation Alley which is a, an assembly a, 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 now on a cast of, of, of a group of characters trying to get from um, the desert southwest across the United States to New York where they think there's a surviving colony of, of living uncontaminated human beings in an area that is viable for life. Um, it's over the top. It is wacky. It is absurd. Um, the special effects do not hold up well. The acting is a little on the plastic side. But man, it's got the Landmaster. One of the coolest, if not the coolest, post-apocalyptic vehicle ever to grace this world. Um, and the people try. Jan Michael Vincent gave it a, gave it a, gave it a great shot. Um, you know, it, it, his, he was never what you would call a, a wide or broad actor. But he had a certain spark that he brought to every role he played. He brought it here. And I just so much love this film. It resonated with me when I first saw it when it was released. And I have seen it, you know, dozens of times since then. And I, I, I fell in love with it from the first sight. And it got inspired me to read the, the, the story, which, again, wasn't bad, but it wasn't what the movie was. It was completely different. The connection is tenuous at best. Um, mostly they got the title and the vague story outline. I could have described the story to someone in an elevator between floors and that's what they would have based the movie on and it's about as close as they got with the, with, between the book and the film. Um, but if you love post-apocalyptic films, Damnation Alley is, is one of the greatest ever made and I, I, I highly recommend it. And you know, if for no other reason, and it has the the uh, the line, atomic cockroaches. <laughs>